You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. In terms of numbers, it's the biggest, you know, loss of life incident we've had in modern British history. We began to learn little bits about how my dad had actually died. He'd actually, you know, been infected through this drug produced by pharmaceutical companies. My, my father had raised concerns because he started to hear things, you know, in, in, there was articles going on in late 1984 in the newspapers, you know, this drug could carry the AIDS virus. He'd raised that concern with his doctor and was told um, that's media sensationalism, they don't know what they're on about, carry on taking factor eight. And then not long after he, he, he tests positive for HIV. I don't think there was this realization that they were they were literally, it's almost like you were sharing needles with 10,000 people every time you used this product. And if you're using it, you know, every week, over the course of a year, if you're using this a week, multiple times a week, you, you're exposing yourself to the blood of literally millions of donors. And, and I don't think the, the people that use the drug had any understanding of that. The manufacturers had every understanding of that. And I think, you know, at the heart of this, it's a perfect example of, of profit over patients. Factor 8 is commercial, commercialized. You know, millions and millions of dollars of this drug are sold. People are infected with hepatitis, HIV. Thousands of people go on to die. You know, worldwide, globally, this, this wasn't just limited to the UK. It's a shit storm and a half, like you're talking thousands of bodies, lives lost. You're talking billions of pounds compensation. This ain't just one or two people. This is thousands and thousands of people who've lost their life. If you look back over the years, you know, what has happened is the government have managed to just buy, buy it off with support payments to some of the surviving victims. Do you ever fear for your life that you're going up against such a higher power? Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Jason Evans. How are you, Jason? Very good. Good. Glad to be here, James. And thank you for, you know, coming back to me and, and giving me this opportunity. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, it's, today's a very interesting story. It's for to kind of expose the NHS for one of the biggest cover-ups cover, cover of all time, like um, Factor 8, I think it's called, which we'll touch on. Their treatment infected over 1,500 people with AIDS and over 4,000 people with hepatitis C, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a huge scandal. I mean, I made the point in the In Cold Blood documentary, which was broadcast a couple of years ago, that if, if you look at the contaminated blood scandal, which is the term, I think people that have heard of this will know as the contaminated blood scandal. In terms of numbers, it's the biggest, you know, loss of life incident we've had in modern British history, arguably now with COVID, you know, that may be disputed, but, you know, up until COVID at least, you know, if you, if you look at other d disasters, if that's the right word, whether it's Hillsborough, Birmingham bombings, you know, wh whatever it is, it eclipses all of them combined. It's, it's more on a scale of, of a 9-11, you know, times two, yet it's relatively understated in the in the grand scheme of things and it's it's a complex story um but it all revolves around this drug factor eight which is a even though we call it the contaminated blood scandal factor eight is a manufactured pharmaceutical drug that looks more like something you know like a medicine that you'd buy off a shelf in a box and this medicine factor eight was made by pooling or mixing together the blood plasma donations of thousands and thousands of people, often from overseas, um, often paid. And th the problem when, when you do that is it means you only need one person infected with hepatitis C, HIV, and they contaminate the whole batch. That really is where, where the problem starts. But I mean, you're right. It's, it's been a huge cover up and I'm happy to get into the, the nuts and, and, and bolts of it because I think the, the story needs, you know, to, to be told. Yeah, definitely. If this is a massive cover up, then it, 
it deserves to have more light on it but you got involved in this because your dad was infected which we'll touch on later on in the interview but first and foremost I want to just get a bit of understanding about you and that's why I always go back to the start of my guests where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah I mean I'm, I'm born in Birmingham but, but raised in Coventry. Left Birmingham when I was four um, which is, is the age I was when my dad died and he was infected with uh, both hepatitis C and HIV through these factory uh, uh, products. And, you know, growing up, I was pretty ignorant, I guess, to what had happened. I understood that my dad had died of AIDS, but it was quite a, it was something that you kind of didn't talk about, you didn't discuss it, especially because AIDS is, is it's always been one of those things where, you know, it's the it's the funny thing, right? It's the thing that people make jokes about it. It's got all the stigma attached to it. You, you wouldn't, you know, at school, you wouldn't want to be the kid that says, oh, guess what? My dad died of AIDS, you know? And I've just spoken to many people like me who have lost their parents to this. And everyone knows that feeling. You, you don't want to be exposed as, as that kid. So you don't talk about it. You don't mention it. It's a secret. And, and even within the family, you know, you, you don't talk about this really. So I kind of, it was on the periphery. All I knew was that my dad had died and he died in some way that you just didn't uh, talk about. But as I got older, I think I began to have more questions. And so when I guess I was becoming a teen, starting secondary school, that sort of age, I am, um, it was kind of at that time as well, that I started secondary school, the internet started to really become a thing in terms of like everyone was getting it. Google was like quite a new thing. And I started to just search for contaminated blood scandal, uh, factor eight. Wasn't that much available, but I began to ask my mom questions at that point. And, uh, you know, she'd get real upset about the whole thing actually, whenever I mentioned it. But, um, I began to learn bits, you know, I began to learn little bits about how my dad had actually died. He'd actually, you know, been infected through this drug produced by pharmaceutical companies. And that really, I guess, was the beginning of me opening, you know, what, what I always call the Pandora's box. Still though, at that point, as a teenager, I didn't really jump into it in the way I would later. That was really in my mid to late, 20s around 2015 I really dove headlong into wanting to get to the truth about the contaminated blood scandal doing right not just by my dad but by you know everyone that had been impacted by it and uh well since 2015 it's been a hell of a ride to to say the least yeah because sad. anybody that's diagnosed with AIDS is there's people know as it's either a drug addict or sexual like through his blood what is it how, how is AIDS attached is it two different forms so so with with AIDS it's it's the thing that actually infects people is HIV the human immunodeficiency yeah. virus so it's immune system that's right it, it basically HIV you know in simple terms it destroys someone's immune system and once your immune system has been destroyed enough um, it's done on something called T-cell count how many T-cells you have once you have only a certain number of those left, that's when your diagnosis becomes AIDS, which basically means you've got little to no immune system left. And so at that point, there are all kinds of um, what we call opportunistic infections that people get. Um, forms of pneumonia are very common in people with AIDS, oral candida of the mouth, lots of different infections. And basically your body has little to no defense to fight those infections. And so, I mean, really before 96, 97, when the antiretroviral drugs that people who were diagnosed with HIV would use today, um, those kinds of drugs became available. Before that time, there was really, you know, if you got HIV, you were on a ticking clock, um, really, which could be anything from a couple of years to maybe 10 years if you're on the lucky side. Um, but really it, it was a ticking clock down to death. How did your dad get diagnosed? So he, he found out in 1985, mid 1985, uh, both he and my mom had gone to a standard appointment 
at the hospital where he he would have appointments for his haemophilia, which is a uh, inherited um, blood clotting disorder. Um, and that that disorder, haemophilia, is the condition um, for which people were given this factor eight drug. It was to treat that blood clotting disorder. And so with, with that disorder, it means that, um, that there's a, a common misunderstanding with haemophilia that it means if you get a paper cut or something, you're gonna, you're gonna bleed to death, which really isn't the case at all. It's, it's more um, internal bleeding into, into big joints. So if, if I was to bang my leg really hard on this table, um, I, I might get a bleed in my knee, for example. And where for um, someone like me or yourself, that's not a big deal. For someone with haemophilia, that's going to probably lead to quite significant um, bruising at best. Um, so here my mum had gone to a haemophilia appointment and it was there that he was told uh, mid-1985, not long after they both got married, um, you've got HIV, which it would later transpire from his medical records. The hospital had actually known that for a good six months uh, plus before actually telling him. And, and that um, is not uncommon at all. When, you know, I've spent the last um, couple of years listening to every witness give evidence to the public inquiry that's going on now. And that is such a common theme of medical records showing that uh, people's um, treating physicians knew they had HIV for significant periods of time, in some cases years, without actually uh, explaining this to the patient. And so, I mean, when my mum and dad were told, it was pure shock, especially because it had only been, it was only in the November of 1984, so seven, you know, a few months uh, prior to this, that they had actually been, um, my, my father had raised concerns because he started to hear things, you know, in, in, there was articles going on in late 1984 in the newspapers, you know, this drug could carry the AIDS virus. He'd raised that concern with his doctor and was told um, that's media sensationalism. They don't know what they're on about, carry on taking factor eight. And then not long after he, he, he tests positive for HIV. So there was warnings there that you could catch AIDS? But, so why was it still then produced for people to take? Well, this is this is kind of at the heart of the public inquiry that's going on now. It's at the heart of the argument because I think it's generally accepted that by 1983, in 1982, there were clear signs that the AIDS virus was in these products. And in fact, one of the... Um, Department of Health's own epidemiologists, um, Dr. Galbraith, we have this letter, it's a well-known letter within the inquiry that's going on, actually warned um, and, he, and he, he told um, the Department of Health that these products should be withdrawn from use um, in 1983. So this is two years before my dad finds out he's got HIV, but that never happened. And the drugs carried on uh, being sold by these American pharmaceutical companies. The, the main companies involved uh, were Bayer, Baxter, Abbott, and a subsidiary of Revlon Healthcare called Armour. And I, I think that's one of the things that always interests people with this scandal is that Revlon today, you think of this as a company that makes makeup, lipstick, hair dryers, these kinds of things, right? But most people don't know that in the 80s, uh, a division of the then Revlon, Revlon Healthcare, manufactured these factor eight products, which infected thousands of people with hepatitis and HIV, um, which, which casts a bit of a different light on, on the Revlon uh, of the day. You know. When was the first, uh, when did it first come about? The eight, when was it AIDS, eighties, late seventies? So the first, I mean, the first reports of AIDS were 1981, 1982, and it, it started off really in terms of the reporting um, in, in, America, mostly in LA, San Francisco, um, areas of high homosexual uh, population. It started off in the gay, the gay community um, in terms of it, it, it being suspected that this is a transmissible 
virus that could be transmissible through blood or, or blood products. And I mean, really, you know, one of the common things that's said is that people with hemophilia were like the canaries in the coal mine, because if you've got this new um, transmissible virus, people that are receiving products that are made by mixing together the blood plasma of thousands or tens of thousands of people are probably going to be among the first people to get it because of th their... I don't think there was this realization that they were they were literally... It's almost like you were sharing needles with 10,000 people every time you used this product. And if you're using it, you know, every week, over the course of a year, if you're using this a week, multiple times a week, you, you're exposing yourself to the blood of literally millions of donors. And, and I don't think the, the people that use the drug had any understanding of that. The manufacturers had every understanding of that. And I think, you know, at the heart of this, it's a perfect example of, of profit over patient safety because, you know, so far we focused on HIV AIDS, but the, the warning signs were there, you know, with this product long before that, going back to its inception. It first came on the market in, in sort of the, the mid 70s in, in a major way. And even at that time, before it was introduced, the big problem was hepatitis. Um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. And it was known, the documents show that we've seen through the inquiry, the manufacturers were aware of hepatitis even, even then. And so I think, you know, what, what's going to come out through the inquiry, what lies um, really firmly in this is, is before the factor eight concentrate drugs that we're talking about, the treatment that was given to people with hemophilia before that was called cryoprecipitate, which I think the easiest way to think of that is something close to a regular blood transfusion where it comes from one volunteer blood donor on the NHS who's, who's giving a donation out of the goodness of their heart, basically, because it's a good thing to do for the community for patients. But what happened with fat concentrates is you, you took this kind of goodwill gesture through the NHS and it was commercialized by the pharmaceutical industry into a new product, which the only benefits were convenience in the sense of it was a bit quicker to use than the old treatment in the sense of it could be kept at home in a fridge rather than um, the old treatment, which had to be kept in a freezer, or, or you might have to go to hospital to, 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 to get it. So they, they, the ph pharmaceutical industry commercialized what, what wasn't a commercial thing. Um, and, and that's really where it all went wrong, because when you have the warning signs, when the dangers are there, there's this motive, the, mo the money motive to not act. Yeah, the pharmaceutical industry have got my own opinions on that, but for me, they don't create they don't create cures. They create customers. It's a, the biggest organisation on the planet. The pharmaceutical industry has it's proven that more people die through pharmaceutical drugs than any other drug on this planet. But the factor eight started in the seventies. The AIDS virus came in eighties. Do you ever think maybe that the factor eight was the one that maybe started AIDS? Could that have blood transfusions and people taking that, that could have maybe started the virus or am I way off, key track, way off course here? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think without a doubt that the HIV virus being in factor eight um, sped up probably the introduction of HIV in the UK because this, you know, uh, virus HIV, uh, in terms of the Western world, as far as we know, there's there's all kinds of theories ab out there about the origins of HIV and yeah, you know, did, stuff like that. Did it come from Africa? Yeah. Was it? Did it come from a, a lab? It, you know, there's all these things, and you know, I I'm not sure we'll ever really know, you know, the truth on that. But but I think what what is proven is that by these um, drugs being made from the plasma of individuals in America. Uh, in South America and being paid um, and harvested from high viral risk populations. And then people in the UK being infected with HIV through those drugs, that that must have sped up the introduction of HIV into the UK. Because there are many, I know personally some of the women involved who, who, were, who were infected by their partners. And, and it's worth saying here, something 
interesting to hemophilia is that almost all people um, with the the most common forms of hemophilia are male. There is such such a thing as as females having hemophilia, but it's much rarer. And so, by and large, it, it was men who were infected, and some of them did infect, um, you know, their partners unwittingly with with HIV. And in fact, there's there's one girl I know who's who's a similar age to me, who her her father was infected with HIV through Factor VIII, infected her mother and both of her parents died within weeks of each other when she was i think eight or nine years old you know was orphaned by this and receives no kind of ongoing government yeah. support or any or anything like that and so it's you know the fallout of it is is massive so the majority of people who've got hemophilia are male yeah yeah but then that, then the connection by with the gay scene as well with aids spreading like if you have getting treated for haemophilia and then the HIV starts, then it makes sense that it can be, because I know the gay scene in the 80s was, they spoke out a lot about AIDS like, and how it started. Like there's, everything, everything can be conspiracies as well. Like we don't have the answers for everything. I'm not too clued up about this, only for the documentary and some of the articles that I've read, but it's just crazy that I believe everything is man-made. I believe everything in this universe has been created by man, whether it's disease and it's crazy to think that it's a possibility that something could be created that could have then spread the AIDS virus from something. So haemophilia, if you didn't get haemophilia treated, what what would happen to you? Sure. I mean, so I mean on, on the the first point about about it being I mean, it's it's been, you know, mentioned to me by by a bunch of people about, you know, the possibility that that HIV, you know, could be man made. I, th I think it's similar in a way to to where we're at now. You know, there's this big debate with COVID, right? About did it come from the Wuhan lab? You know, maybe. Um, and, and I and I kind of think the same with with HIV. You know, maybe, but but I I don't know, and I, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we'll we'll ever know. Um, you know, not I'm, important enough to know those answers. Are that, there? Well, that's it. That's it. You know, um, we're 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 just the the mere little people. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and 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 so then coming on to the, the hemophilia, what happens if you don't get it treated? I mean, there are different levels of hemophilia: mild, moderate, and severe are the general classifications. And so, factor eight itself, although it's the name of this drug, the the reason why it's called factor eight is that. Um, my understanding as a, as a you know, non-medically qualified person is that within the blood, there are various um, proteins which help the blood to clot. Um, and one of those, uh, there are different factors, these different proteins, factors one, two, three, four. And one of them is factor eight. And in the case of haemophilia B, which is a slightly different kind of haemophilia, it's factor nine. Um, and so if you've got mild haemophilia a, which is, is haemophilia A is the most common form of haemophilia, um, then you've got, let's say, a bit of, of this type of protein missing in, in your blood that you should have. If you've got moderate, you've got quite a bit more. And if you've got severe, then you really don't have much factor eight um, at all. So that, depending on your form, that, that can affect things. Um, but in terms of if you're not treated, I mean, this is part of the big argument is you know, the Department of Health and people on the other side of this argument would say, well, it was a choice between having this factor eight concentrate drug or nothing at all, which if you're not treated at all for severe haemophilia, you know, for for something not so serious, um, you could put some ice on it and have bed rest. I'm going off what, what I've been told by people with haemophilia uh, I know. So no treatment can be an option in, in some cases. It might not be preferable in the long term, but sure, if there's a crisis in the, with, with the drugs that are being used, then should it be considered, perhaps? Um, for other things, you could use the previous treatment, cryoprecipitate. And in fact, that treatment that was used throughout the, the, the 60s, this cryoprecipitate treatment, if you go back and you look at the studies from that time about this cryoprecipitate that was being used, they all speak so highly of it, saying that it's it's the cure for haemophilia. That that was the headlines of some of the newspaper articles. And I actually made a short documentary about this um, within the last year called Cryospiracy, which is on the, the Factor 8 
um, YouTube channel, which goes right to this point that when you look at the narrative of the time about cryoprecipitate, it's all made to sound like it's the best thing since sliced bread. Factor 8 is commercial, commercialized. You know, millions and millions of dollars of this drug are sold. People are infected with hepatitis, HIV. Thousands of people go on to die. You know, worldwide, globally, this, this wasn't just limited to the UK. And then all of a sudden then, the narrative since by those on the other side of this argument is that cryoprecipitate was rubbish, it didn't really work. And it's a narrative that's changed, you know, from the time to now. And it's all part of that defense because the, the reality is if the state is found to be, you know, liable for the contaminated blood scandal, not only is it going to be, you know, an acceptance that it was those officials in, in power at the time, you know, the government ministers in power at the time that allowed this to happen, but also the amounts of compensation that would have to be paid to people would be substantial. Because remember, we're not talking about a situation where this virus is out there in the general population. It was unfortunate that, that people got this. This was a case of these manufacturers and the state also manufactured this product. The Department of Health had its own blood products laboratory where it made these products too, some of them. Taking a virus, hepatitis HIV, pooling it, you know, thousands of times over, massively increasing the risk, and then putting it into people's bodies, knowing of those dangers. And, and I think if and when, you know, that's, that's, we get that on the official record, and I, I do think that's coming. I think the evidence the inquiry now has heard is, is so damning already, and there's another year to go. It's expected to report mid, mid next year. It's, it's going to be massive, I think, when this finally comes out. It's been brewing for decades, and I think finally we're, we're going to get there. But that's a, that's a shit storm and a half. Like you're talking thousands of bodies, lives lost. You're talking billions of pounds compensation. This ain't just one or two people. This is thousands and thousands of people who've lost their life. A lot of people were not able to fight this either and not be here to get compensation. I'd imagine a lot of people who's passed, family members, friends, because you're talking over 30 years ago, but... If this comes out and it's all true, then this is one of the biggest cover up of all time. It's not listen, there's many scandals and many cover ups, but to then shed in light, do you have a fear for your life that you're going up against such a higher power? I don't think so. I, I try not to, you know, that's that's something that's been said to me, you know, by a a, a number of people. You know, you need to be careful what you're doing and, and all that sort of thing. I don't whether or not that's misguided, maybe, but you know, I'm I'm a hundred percent in this cause and and there's really for me there's nothing that's that's gonna stop or deter or dilute you know what i'm trying to do because i'm in this you know for for the right reason i'm trying to do right by my dad and all those impacted and and nothing you know is is, is gonna stop me at this point you know i i have said once this inquiry has run its course and once the there's a a, a legal action a group legal action at the high court that's running alongside this as well. Once those two things have come to a conclusion, either way, um, I'm, I'm done with it. You know, I'm in it a hundred percent until those two things are, are done. But also, you know, this has gone on for 30 years and it ruined my dad's life. You know, it's ruined my mom's life to a, a, a big extent as well. And, you know, it's taken over my life for, for a long, long time. And I think there's a certain point where I have to be realistic and say, I think I've, I've done everything I can, you know? So there is that danger that, that we don't get there, but, but I do believe we're on the right track. And I think we will, you know, blow the lid off this thing once and for all, because if you look back over the years, you know, what has happened is the government have managed to just buy buy it off with support payments to some of the surviving victims and so what what happens is you know the campaign might gain some momentum it looks like it's going somewhere something might come out 
and then the 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 governments have the these the government has this um is like a benefits welfare scheme and so they'll say well we'll we'll put in a bit more money uh and you know you can have some more welfare payments to the people that are eligible for those and it, and it's cooled things down and all the while that's been going on people have been dying right so of the original uh, 1243 people infected with hiv for instance there are around 200 left you know, so there's a lot more people. When I go to those inquiry hearings day in, day out, there should be a hell of a lot more people. Well, in theory, no one should be going to these inquiry hearings because it shouldn't have happened. But with the inquiry going on, there, you know, in theory, there should be a hell of a lot of other people going to them that simply aren't here, you know. When did they stop producing factor it? So what happened was in the mid-80s, around 85, 86, the they began to heat treat the product um which rendered it free of hiv and and mostly um hepatitis as well and that's one of the crazy things about this story as well there's there's so many elements to it but that something as simple as just heating this product up um made it safe and and so in, I can't remember the exact times and temperatures, but I think it was something like 60 degrees at, at 72 hours or something um, to kill H HIV. Um, made it safe. Does and that make you angry, though, that that could have saved your dad's life? That It's always going to make you angry anyway that there's a potential that your dad was, was murdered, yeah. basically. But see, because it says that you can catch AIDS, does that not cover them? That, listen, you've took it your own will, that we've actually says that you can catch AIDS. So even though... It's, then it's not as if it's not they've not told you. So then they've got they've still got something to fight for, have they not? That well, it's you take um, you can take antidepressants, and on the box it can say it can still make you suicidal. So even though it says that on the tin, if they got a case that then that it, they basically it's not as if you found out that this new product is giving people HIV or AIDS, or it's actually telling you that they do they can get it. So is that not a case for them to say well people took it their own free will i mean it's it's really in so the, the inquiry actually looked at this um recently when um over a period of weeks a couple of months ago it was looking at the pharmaceutical companies and it specifically looked at the labels that were on the boxes and the bottles and what warnings if any those labels contained and what was really really interesting to see at no point up until much later, after everyone was infected, sort of 85, 86 onwards, did those labels say, you know, may infect you with HIV, may transmit the AIDS virus? It just wasn't there. That that just wasn't the case. So, I mean, even if that was a defense, um, it, it wasn't there. But I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what what the law is, but it would still seem crazy to me that if you knew this product, bear in mind at the time, HIV in particular, without treatment, it will kill you. The, you know, no ifs, ands, and buts, it will kill you without treatment at, at a certain point. That you could still sell a product, even if it was on the label, which it wasn't, but that you could still say, well, this might kill you, but if you want to take it, that's, that's what, you know, we, we don't do that in, in other areas, right? If, I mean, there are some exceptions, right? For example, with cigarettes, I guess. They say, you, you know, if you want to smoke these, smoke them. They might kill you, but that's up to you. But there's a lot of other things where, you know, where we just we just wouldn't wouldn't allow that, especially when the risk is so high, right? At a certain point when the risk is so high, you have to pull that drug off the, off the market, which, which didn't happen. It's life or death. Yeah. yeah. Was your mum ever concerned that she would have caught the virus and then potentially pass it on to you because mother and uh, birth... That's where you can also contact, contact the virus where was she ever concerned that she ever had the virus and yourself? Yeah, I mean that. So there are cases where that has happened. Um, it's called vertical transmission, I believe, when it goes from mother to child. I mean, it, it was a huge concern, you know, for that. The period between 85 when my dad found out he had HIV and 93 when he died of it, that whole period, you know, of, of their life was totally dominated by fear, you know, in, in, in so many ways. But in particular, you know, I was born in 89 and between 85 and 89, 
I think my mum and dad's relationship would have been very difficult. You know, I've discussed it with with my mum, and you know, I think um, you know, I, I've and I've had many discussions with my mother, uh, you know, about their relationship at that time, and you know, they took a risk and and they they got lucky, um, but but other people didn't, you know, and other women um, did contract HIV, you know, with. Um, heterosexual intercourse the risk is is lower um than it than it might be otherwise um but but plenty of women did 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 get infected you know when my whole birth me being born was dominated by fears that my mom had hiv and that i might have hiv in consequence and so you know you may have seen because i think it's quite early on in the documentary um it shows my birth sheet and it says biohazard on yeah, there's it. a stamp on it and i had you know biohazard stickers on my cot in the hospital and you know as soon as i come out hiv test as, as a baby you know so and and the staff you know were dressed in like the the whole spacesuit you know get up and all of that so my whole you know being born was not a scenario of this is a happy moment we're having a baby it was really dominated by this fear that I might have HIV. What does that mean? Could could he could that infect the staff? Could that, you know, that was my experience of being yeah. born for everyone else. Do you know? feel as if that's why you're here on this planet to try and expose what's went on? Like, because it took a chance basically for you to be born, because they know there was no treatment, but really treatment back then. So if you're born, you're dead, and possibly your mother. So that's three lives took away straight away. So the chance is that you've not got it. Your mum's not got it. You're still here to tell the tale. Like I say, it never really bothered you for many years. Then obviously the, the, a light popped up and it's made you look into something. And this is where we are. Like, who is it you're up against then? I mean, yeah, a, a lot of the big players. I mean, I, I mean, just, just on that as well. I mean, I certainly, I do have a sense of that. You know, I do have a sense of the fact they took that risk. And there, there have been times where I've thought to myself, you know, I'm dedicating so much of my life, so much of my time to this fight and and should instead should i be doing something something else you know in in life something that i would love to do like a passion project or whatever and i always just come back to, to you know similar to what you you've just been touching on that you know they took the risk i could have never existed and i got to do right by my dad so so this is this is what we're doing at, at the end of the day and this has almost become a passion project but perhaps not for usual or reason or the the reasons which are positive you know to to most most things but yeah i'm I'm in it for the fight and the fight is against i mean yeah there are multiple fronts that there, there is i think it would be easy to say the government right but but it but it's it's less the government actually the real fight is against the people who have the real power in my opinion in Westminster which is the senior civil servants and and the the the, the officials i think there's a real common misconception and and it's something that i used to think before i ever got involved in this i was the same person who you get angry at the faces you see on the telly right whether that's boris johnson or it's keir starmer pick a party you know any 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 party yeah, they're all fucking clones it's a, it's irrelevant because the the people that actually wield the power i've you know that i've i've seen it when i've gone for these meetings in the cabinet office been to parliament many many countless times you see it that the 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 old adage is that advisors advise ministers decide that's what they say and so because of that people say well ministers decide so that's the decision maker so you know if boris decides this or you know rishi sunak decides that that's their decision but what I've witnessed is that the real power resides with the person who decides the choices that those people get to decide on. You know, so it's those senior civil servants, those people, you know, in, in its simplest form, you know, to, to give you an example, you could say, you know, minister, we've got a choice here between apples and oranges. And I can make the oranges option sound really, really terrible because I want you to go for the apples option. So you, you pick apples because it seems obvious. But then w what isn't there is actually there was an option option C, bananas, which I as the senior civil servant never even put on the table because I, I don't like that idea for whatever reason. 
So for me, they're the people that, that wield the real power. And those people, this is the really important thing, those people in the cabinet office, in every department, they're, they are unelected. They, they don't come and go every five years. They, they can be there for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Most people don't even know these people's names. They don't even really know they exist. They are nameless. They're faceless. And they sit there for decades in some cases through four different governments. But that same person is still there. You know, hello, Mr. New Prime Minister. I'm the person that's going to tell you how this all works for the next how many years. And then when that Prime Minister's gone, in comes the next one. Hello, I'm the person that... And I've, I've, I've seen that, you know, and I think our community has witnessed that. It doesn't matter who you've got in government. It's those civil servants, you know, and, and it's, it's worth saying, you know, there are some real decent people, you know, some decent MPs that do want to do the right thing, do want to help. You know, there are people that have helped our cause. None of them are perfect, just like no people are perfect. But, you know, um, Andy Burnham has been good to us, Diana Johnson has been, you know, good to us. Alistair Burt has been good to us. MPs from, you know, different parties. There's been some who are conservative, some who are Labour. But it all comes back to this point. That I, 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 In my experience in campaigning and being around Westminster, the party element really isn't that important. I think that's really for the telly, you know, that, you know, I, I, I hate the left or I hate Tories or I hate, everyone just wants a team, but... What really matters is the people, and there are some good people there, but all too often, the people that are really in power, most people don't know their name and won't know their name. Of course, man. It's the people behind the curtain pulling That's the strings. It. And if you're going, if you're not with the narrative, you ain't going to be prime minister. You ain't going to be in charge. That's, that's the good people. The ones who are never really going to get there. Yes, they'll help a few people here and there because they have got goodness, but they're never going to get full control to try and make positive changes for the world. The reason why the, the world the way it is is because the power that's behind that, pulling the strings to make everybody divided left, right, doesn't really mean anything. What the fuck are you actually fighting? Like, Why are you waiting for a government to tell you what you can and cannot do with your life? This is your life, your journey. Do what the fuck you want. As long as you're not hurting anybody, do what you want. Don't, stop waiting for some plonker to come on the TV and tell you what you can and cannot do. Like, I don't know all the answers and I don't want to be this mad conspiracy nut, but unless I see it with my own eyes, then everything is a conspiracy to me because I don't know. You can read something that could be absolute bullshit. Other people could read it and think it's facts. Like reading something doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. Seeing something for me then gives me the indication that, okay, that's what I can take what I want out and believe what I want. Like everybody sees the world differently. There's not two brains on this planet that think the same. So, I don't want to be against the government, this and that. Like, there's, like you say, there is good people there that do good, but if you're out there to destroy lives for a quick buck, for me, you're evil. For me, you're part of the devil's plan. Like, for me, that's... That's right. And, you know, some, sometimes it's not... It's not always that... I, I personally try and believe that most people are good people or at least think they're doing the right thing, even if they're not. They they at least have that in, in intention. But I think one of the things that... I've seen happen is that whether it's a government official or it's it, it's someone within the government, there can be this. It's very easy, I think, once you get close to that world, whether that's me as a, as a campaigner or someone as an MP or a lawyer or whatever. There can be this temptation to get cozy and to and to see these people as to want to be best friends, you know, with with these people, whether or not you think they're doing something wrong or if something's not right or to take this approach of, well, we need to build bridges. You know, I've always hated that phrase, build bridges, as in you should, you know, take stick off someone doing the wrong thing because you don't want to sever a potential relationship that might be helpful to you in, in the future. And, you know, my personal view on that is I've always just called it out as I see it. I mean, even... Um, you know, to, today there's been an article um, gone out on the Open Democracy website about um, Sue Gray, who um, is the civil servant who's leading this party gate investigation into the Downing Street parties. I've had uh, experience with Sue Gray because when I was trying to get 
documents from the Treasury about the contaminated blood scandal through the Freedom of Information Act, I was struggling to get those documents. So I then made freedom of information requests to get emails from a department within the cabinet office that I suspected were interfering. And Sue Gray was one of the people who was basically suggesting ways that they could try and find not to give me these documents, which are basically about how my dad died and the government's response to his death, as well as many others. And she was saying in those emails that this should be managed like the Chilcot inquiry and things of this nature. And then this now is the person they've tasked to lead this investigation into the Downing Street parties. And so that that article is is really looking at my experience with Sue Gray and the fact that now this is the person being trusted to lead a full and transparent investigation. I'm not so confident based on my personal experience. So the people who have passed away and been infected, you say for over 1,500 with AIDS and over 4,000 with hepatitis C, is that just UK numbers? Yeah, so so in the UK, 4,000 4, were infected with hepatitis C, thereabouts approximately, um, uh, just over 1,200 with, with, with H, HIV. That's in the UK. And those numbers aren't exact, because this, this is another interesting thing is that the Department of Health, if you were to go to the Department of Health, our government right now, and say to them, in any way you want, FOI, uh, a, a question in Parliament, write to your MP, however you want to do it. If you were to ask the government, how many people were infected through the blood scandal, how many people have died, they will basically tell you, we don't know, go and ask this organization called the UK HCDO, which stands for the United Kingdom Haemophilia Centre director's organization that is a private company and if you go to them because they're a private company they have no obligation to provide that data to anybody and um they don't so it could be more so it, it could be, it could be more could and be less. it could be slightly less but the, the reason why we're p pretty confident on the four thousand and that we know with hiv those figures are correct because of um, numbers that were involved in litigation in sort of the early 90s. And also this organization, this private company, the UKHCDO, they manage something called the National Haemophilia Database, which is a database of all the people in this country with haemophilia and what they've been infected with, which I, I know this sounds crazy now, I'm saying it out loud, but this, this has been going on since 1969, this organization. You know, people can look this up, you can Google it, UKHCDO, you'll, you'll find it. And so they've been doing this since 1969. And this private company, if, if you were to go to them and, and make a specific request and say, how many people with hemophilia have been infected with hepatitis C, HIV, and how many of them have died? I've tried many times. They just won't give that information. And Why is that? I, I wish, I wish I knew the answer. I, I really do. It's, it's bizarre that it's been set up in that way, right? That this private company is holding public data about patients treated through the NHS. And you know, I said in my witness statement to the infected blood inquiry that this whole thing has been set up in a way I would set it up. If, I, if there was some information that I didn't want people to be able to get. So, I mean, they're the UK numbers we know. It could be more. We just simply don't know. Does that make you question everything a bit more? And could they potentially say there was no one infected? And that goes against you in court. Could they say that? No, I, d I don't think. I mean, we, we know that the, their database has the records of the most accurate records of the people infected. Um, you know, I, I know personally a lot of the people that, that were infected. The, the one problem we don't have actually is, um, I guess what they call in the legal world causation in the, the department of health, the government, they don't, um, argue that they, they don't say people weren't infected and they weren't infected through these products. They accept that, people were infected, they by and large accept the numbers of 1,200 HIV, 4,000 hepatitis 
that's not a dispute. And even the pharmaceutical companies don't dispute that. Our argument is that it was wrong, basically. So, so present the, the the Department of Health line, the pharmaceutical company line has been that yes, these products were infected, yes, it was a terrible tragedy, but it wasn't our fault. Nothing else could have been done. No one could have foreseen that this would happen. It was all just a terrible accident, which you know now through the inquiry we're seeing that's none of that is true none of those things are, are are true but that's that's been the sticking point right are you in contact with anybody else around the world that's maybe fighting the same cause yeah i mean over over the years i'd imagine uh, american um, numbers would be high yeah so i believe in america there was something like ten thousand people infected with hiv alone um so the numbers in america were, were much bigger because of their bigger population and because all of their product was from paid donors Whereas, so it could have been homeless people, drug addicts, giving blood? Yeah, so with, with these pharmaceutical companies, they would set up their plasma collection centers in, you know, the common phrase used is skid row areas, basically areas where people are desperate for money, for, for, for money which is going to be IV drug users, you know, homeless people. Basically people who are at high risk for, for, for viral diseases. Um you know, over the years, I've also been in touch with our counterparts in Canada as well. I know that in Italy, um, not too long ago, <clears throat> there was a criminal case going on against one of the pharmaceutical companies. I'm not too sure what the status of that is. It's actually quite hard to keep up with that because I don't know um, Italian and, and deciphering Italian court documents can be a bit of a uh, a task but um, I mean this has affected people all around the world but there are some countries that dealt with it um, in a much better way so for example in Japan um, I think they dealt with this quite well uh, quite a long time ago where there were criminal prosecutions um, people went to jail the government actually forced the pharmaceutical companies to go into a joint compensation agreement uh, to the victims and families and that was in the late 90s you know so this was decades ago that it was sorted out in japan uh in france there were criminal prosecutions people went to jail um there were other countries that just had a different approach so for example in finland they never changed from cryoprecipitate um again I, this is in my cryospiracy documentary on the factor eight channel they stuck with cryoprecipitate and the reason it specifically says if you look at the documents from finland they didn't move to the factor eight concentrate was because of the higher hepatitis risk and as a result virtually uh, no one in finland was infected with hiv um and so it, in that that for me is the ultimate example of showing that this didn't have to happen. There was another way, and my dad would probably still be alive. A lot of people would still be alive, and, mm. and it didn't have to happen. So what, what did Finland do, sorry? They never, so what did they do? So in, in Finland, yeah. when, when the new factor eight drugs yeah. came out, they just said, no, we're sticking with cryoprecipitate, the, the, the treatment from the 60s that was already being used here as well. And that was the one that was already working? Yep, already working. And they said, we're keeping factor eight, you know, concentrate out of Finland. They never used it. And as a result, the, the scandal there just didn't happen. Yeah. You know? Well, money talks to push out pharmaceutical drugs. What happens is they get paid. It's as simple as that. Do you know what I mean? It's, that would make me angry as well that it could have been stopped. Like other, if other countries are not taking it because of, there could be consequences. Um, but yeah, this is at a global scale. This ain't just the UK. You're talking worldwide where if one product could, is in question, then you've got to question every single product. What it's about, who created that, how damaging it is to the human mind, the human body. Like this, is, this goes at a so much deeper level and I believe this probably wasn't the only product that is killing people. Oh, but. for sure. I mean, they've, they've got now, you know, in the US, they've got the huge issue with opioids, right? That there's killing loads of people. I know there's, there's a lawyer in the US called Mike Papantonio who litigated on factor eight drugs there. And he's doing litigation now in the US on, on opioids. 
which which is killing. I think it's one of the leading causes of death in America at the minute is is people dying, um, killing themselves because of these. I think it's, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I believe it's some kind of anti-depression drug. And that's going on right now. And you hear very, very little about that, you know, at all. But it's one of the leading causes of death in, in the US, you know. Yeah, it's nuts, man, like to think that somebody was actually putting something out there that could that could kill you. But everything, well, you've got alcohol, you've got cigarettes, you've got sugar, that kills us. But yet, we see it in every shop, we accept it. It's just as fucking bad, if I'm, if I'm honest. Like, I try and do everything as natural as I can and try to be out there in nature and as one. Yes, listen, there's things out there if you take not well and um, there's things that probably could help and probably could cure you and prolong your life. That's amazing. There's doctors out there that do fucking heart transplants and it's unbelievable what they do. But when it comes to the pharmaceutical side of things, is it there to help you and prolong your life or is it there to just keep you down and make your life fucking hell? Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the pharmaceutical industry, it is what it is. But I mean, it's easy, I think, sometimes to think, you know, these are just massive, evil, corrupt organizations and everything they do is bad. I think it can be easy to look at the fact that they sell their products for money, but it takes it also takes a lot of money to design and develop a new drug. And so the the, the, the motto, I believe, in the industry is that profit drives innovation. In, in other words, without the incentive to make money, the companies wouldn't take these massive financial risks to develop new drugs, which all you know makes total sense. But I think the danger can be when when that outweighs the the safety element or when you know they've they've put in such a massive investment into something that if it maybe doesn't turn out to be the drug that they hoped or thought it was that they might just sell it anyway because they want that return on their investment i think something like that you know that there was an element to that with factor eight and i think you still see it now where drugs may not be you know, um, well, they might be less safe, they might be dangerous, which is an instant red flag, you know, um, but also they, they might not be as effective. as. And I think you see that now, where something may not be as effective as we may have hoped it would have been, um, but that's what we've got, so so yeah. that's what we've got. You know? Where was Factor 8 manufactured? So largely um, in the US, the main pharmaceutical companies in, 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 in the US, um, some of it was manufactured in the UK too. There were manufacturing uh, plants in Alstree, uh, in Oxford, and also um, in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Um, but those plants that we had in the UK, uh, well, in, in England, a bit the Scotland one was was largely making enough for Scotland. But the ones in England um, weren't producing as much factor A as the um, Department of Health and the haemophilia doctors would have liked, um, which is used as the reason why we ended up importing so much product from from America, um, which I think it's pretty much accepted that the American product was much more risky in terms of HIV. Um, but it's, it's generally thought amongst the medical community that all of the products um, were basically just as risky in terms of hepatitis. And that and that's because hepatitis is more widely found. So it's thought that somewhere between one in 100 to 200 people in the population um, at that time had hepatitis, which meant that if you're pooling thousands and thousands of donations and one in 100 to 200 people has hepatitis, you're basically guaranteed to have hepatitis in, in one of the batches. Whereas because HIV was um, less prominent in this country at that time, you were more likely to get it in the US and more likely to get it from your paid donors and from, from the prisons, the, the US prisons where, where the plasma was coming from as well. Who got the ball rolling for all this? Was it people behind you? Was it other people that started that? Like who genuinely went up against this pharmaceutical industry and started to make process to maybe take it to court? Like how did it all start? I mean, people people had been fighting and doing bits of campaigning for, well, since the beginning, really, since people found out they, they were infected, people had tried to do things. But I think, you know, especially 
80s, early 90s, a different time. There was no internet. It was so much more harder to find other victims, other other people impacted. Um, I mean, I, I personally got involved around 2015. And the first time I met other people who were infected uh, or, 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 or affected was... I think in early 2016, there was a protest um, outside parliament. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm actually just going to go down and meet the people. And I was, I'd, I'd never met anyone else impacted by it. So I just, yeah, drove down um, to London, turned up to the protest and I met people. And, and it was really, it was good for me, you know, to, to do that. It was good to meet other people that understood it you know, that understood what I'd been through, what my family had been through and felt that same sense of injustice, you know. And so from there, I began to do more research, meet more people, hear more stories. I began to look for lawyers that would be willing to take this case on. Um, I went through about 100 lawyers um, between 2016 and 2017, all of which told me in one form or another, no, this isn't going to happen, or they just flat out uh, ignored me. Um, they would tell me no for lots of reasons. You know, a, a lot of them would say, this is too big, we're too small, think of how much money it would cost us to, to take this on. People would um, see that the government had, um, you know, said it was like all well, some terrible accident or whatever, and said, well, the government have this view on, you know, what do you want us to do? Um, and so it was really, really hard going, tricky going, but we did have some support. In, in parliament in that sort of 2016 um we were making progress there but really i think i think it all really got kicked off um the, the real ball was set in motion at the beginning of 2017 a lot started to happen then because andy burnham who's now the mayor of greater manchester at the time he was an mp and he'd been involved a lot with the hillsborough um campaign and so he um kind of got involved and as as his well, in the January, I went to a meeting in Parliament uh, with with him and a bunch of other MPs and and lords uh, and journalists and lawyers, and I was asked to just give a five to ten minute kind of prose of the contaminated blood scandal. Um, I mean, my heart was pounding out of my, my chest that day because I'd never been to something like that, and I was just aware that you know all these people that you recognise off the TV are there just staring at me and. Anyway, I did my five to 10 minute spiel about the blood scandal. I said what had happened to my uh, dad. And I, and I think I could see like it had kind of touched a few people in, in, in the room. You know, I felt like that there were people from other injustices and scandals there. So that there was people from uh, the Hillsborough families, people from Orgreaves, the miners um, thing and uh, Birmingham pub bombings and, um, and the truth about Zane as well which is another um campaign that really needs to be looked at but um and then we had uh myself and someone else who who themselves is infected a good a good friend of mine um there and after after that kind of meeting um i met two lawyers uh des collins and danny holiday from a firm called collins solicitors and they as i was leaving and uh, they just said oh you know here's our business card give us a call and I had no faith, zero faith, because every other lawyer had just ignored me or shut me down or whatever. So I had no faith at all in, in lawyers at that point. But anyway, you know, moving forward, I got in touch with them in the April and it was around that time as, as well. Um, Andy, Berman, Andy Burnham had used his last speech in Parliament as he was leaving to talk about our campaign for like over an hour. Which, which got some really good media attention. He, he'd been given evidence by a bunch of us and he threatened to go to the police if, if the government didn't announce an inquiry. At the same time, Colin's solicitors went to see them in Watford. They agreed, first time I went to see them, to take our case on, which blew me away because everyone else had said no. So it, a lot was happening. The Department of Health got notified um, that they were being taken to court in the April. At the same time, Andy Burnham starting to go to the police. Also, uh, then in the May, we had a BBC Panorama episode uh, that was on about the scandal as well. That announced publicly the legal action. 
So it was building and building and building and building. Then in the July, uh, the 4th of July, um, we lodged the group legal action with the High Court with, through, through Collins. And also there'd been a letter signed by um, the leaders of each opposition party in Parliament, so Labour, yes, they'd, they'd all signed this this letter saying there should be an inquiry. The legal action goes in and a day to the week after Theresa May announces there's going to be a public inquiry into the contaminated blood scandal. At last, you know, partially because I think it was just a mixture of everything, you know, we'd been campaigning so hard, there was so much momentum, so much media pressure, political pressure, legal pressure. I think it, 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 it had to, it had to come and it finally did. And that inquiry now has been going on for quite a few years. And, um, this year will be the last full year of, of the inquiry. So what happens after the inquiry is done? So, um, for the last couple of months, this was a whole other campaign in itself, which which I won't go into the full details, but the last couple of months, uh, Sir Robert Francis QC has been um, conducting, the government commissioned him to conduct a study into a potential framework for compensation. So he's looking at what compensation could, could look like for people if... Um, the language the government uses is if the inquiry's recommendation points towards liability, something to that effect. So after the inquiry, at a minimum, there could be compensation. It, you know, and sat behind it, we've still got that group legal action, which we asked to be put on hold at the High Court pending the outcome of this inquiry. So, you know, if uh, we don't get what we want through the inquiry and its outcome, we go back to court. Uh, and that, and that and that goes on. Um, I think a lot of people are hoping for criminal prosecutions. I, I think I'm as much as I, I'd, I'd like to see that. I just feel slightly less optimistic about that. I feel. I just feel that it's it might be asking a bit too much, and I, and I feel that, you know, like you you were saying earlier, money money can can buy off. It can detract from that kind of things and maybe that will happen. Um, but I, d I don't know as well. The inquiry has been looking at so many areas. There, there are so many people that stand to be in hot water over this from so many and so many different companies that um, there's a lot that could happen. How many people are you talking? God, I mean, if, if you were looking at after this in the courts at individual cases of clinical negligence, you're, you're potentially looking at fault from, you know, a... Uh, Maybe if you were to combine, you know, all the NHS trusts and health authorities as they once were, you know, at least tens, maybe going into the hundreds of of institutions. And especially if you throw in the, the pharmaceutical companies and their manufacturers and distrib distributors, I don't think it will get to that point where you have that many individuals and companies, you know, on, on the hook for this. I think probably... They'll, they'll be wanting, uh, or the thing that probably makes the, the most sense is a, a statewide, you know, uh, form of restitution to people, which um, it's probably worth mentioning as well happened already in the Republic of Ireland, um, probably about 20 plus years ago now, where the, the government uh, firstly had paid compensation to, to the victims and their families, but also latterly after the inquiry did accept um the responsibility on behalf of the state accepted liability that the state was at fault for what had happened and and i think we'd like to see you know at least that that acceptance of state liability here to say this was wrong you know it shouldn't have happened and we're, we're at fault that that thing that obviously all governments find so hard to to do is it met guilt because it'd be fucking admitting it all for years and years and yeah. years but to try and get convictions that I find that very unlikely as well because there's so much shit out there and you're talking thousands of people. That would take years and years to get people to courts and bold statements, bold cases, and then you're talking more money. It's cheaper just, there's compensation, there's yeah. a sorry. We put our hands up on your way because I had someone else on who, it was a child abuse case and uh, right. kids were being abused for years and years. It went to court. 
but half the kids took half well, adults now took the money because they were skint and they get paid buttons yeah like 15 grand 10 grand and if they took it through the court they would pay hundreds of thousands potentially millions because they took the money yeah the case then they never had a case because the other half they needed everybody so then they had to accept the money and then it never mm. really went it never went through a trial so yeah. money talks and if people are skint if people are on their ass then if compensations there they just want that and you know i get it but what your main goal from it all then is is to get the acknowledgement that they did mess up and to get the people who have lost loved ones to get mm. compensation I mean, yeah for me you know number one on the button is state liability and and also if we can get it the pharmaceutical companies that acceptance whether it's an acceptance or it's put on them you know that they were at fault you know that that is the number one because that's that acknowledgement that actually you know this wasn't just a bunch of people moaning you know we we were right you know ultimately in the end that's that's for sure at at, at the top and i think you know one of the other problems with with prosecutions is that because this has gone on for so long you know this is you know we're talking about things that happened 30 years ago a lot of the people that i would like to have seen prosecuted are, are dead you know lived long and happy lives into their 70s and 80s and 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 have died and i said you know it wasn't that that long ago i met with some of the um the families and people affected by the grenfell tower fire and I said to them, just don't end up like us, you know, don't end up 30 years from now fighting, you know, you know, as much as you can, you know, try and get it right now, because all too often that's what happens. Same with Hillsborough, right? You know, 30 years on still fighting, still trying to get the right thing to happen. And, um, I'm not sure anything's really changed in the grand scale of it. I, and I worry for things like the Grenfell Tower fire, that they're going to be just like us 30 years time, still fighting, still trying to get the answers, still, you know, that, and that's not to say anything bad about the, the Grenfell inquiry or, or the, or the chairman of it. It's just, it just seems to me like that's how these things tend to go when with the establishment. Right. And it's just, you, you, you're lucky if you ever get there, if yeah. you ever get the just... Well, we're just numbers. Like, we're just numbers on this planet. Like, I know people from Grenfell as well, there's a lot, some of the people haven't even had houses yet. It's put houses and houses and I still stay with family members. It's crazy what's actually went on there and innocent lives lost again. No no payout yet. This was what, five years ago? Yeah. Now, maybe more? I don't know. How long ago was that? 2017, June five 2017. Five years ago, coming up for that. It's sad. It's so sad. Like even when I had a I had a sniper on and served up for his country over twenty three years and he got um what was it? Discharged. He got discharged and but then so he's a big ambassador for mental health and there was a meeting at Parliament and obviously you've got the MP's wages, it's full, full people outside you can't get in. And then you had the next week for uh, money for suicide for veterans and there was only four people there do you know what I mean so that basically shows that nobody fucking cares that like you're fighting for a cause that I don't believe in wars anyway but I, but I get that it has it happens and other people believe that it's the right thing to do but it just goes to show that no one cares. Somebody's willing to die for somebody on the front line and then they come back and then they're not bothered or ass. Like, it's mad to think and this goes on so frequently. Like, so if you got answers and got that, then is there any way it can go to a European court? Is there a world court like, where everybody can get together and expose it for what it really is? I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Are, are we out of the European court now? I don't, I don't know. We are, aren't we? Yeah. I, I, I think so. But, um, I mean, funnily enough, there's there's um, a counterpart of ours, a campaigner called uh, Cees Schmidt in the Netherlands, and he has suggested to me on on multiple occasions that he would like to get an international inquiry that looks into the plasma trade at that time, you know, globally, because I, I don't think there's actually a whole bunch of countries that have had full investigations into this. So we're only just having one now. They had one in Canada. They had a commission 
some kind of commission in the US, but I'm, I'm not. I think their system's a bit different to ours in terms of public inquiries. Canada's is a bit closer, and they had one in Australia that, but I think that only looked at hepatitis C um, and not the HIV, from what I know. So there's been some, but. It, it, it's so sporadic and for sure there will be probably far more countries that are impacted by this that have had no investigation than, than those that that have. I mean... So it, even then, we're in the case, say you win a case here and you get the apology, you get the, the acceptance that they'd messed up, you get the money, then that raises question marks for not just the UK but the whole world that this is a deeper level that to think that people have been poisoned... Yeah. with an infection that could have been prevented like that is unbelievable to think that maybe hundreds of thousands of people have potentially died through the hands of someone else that knowing fine well that this is going to poison something and contaminate your blood like I'm sure, it's I mean, a fucking scary thought man I, I get messages and emails all the time from from people you know just recently you know i, I remember getting uh twitter direct messages from um people in argentina that had been infected through factory and and asking me for help and and I didn't really know what to say because you know I'm not sure what I can do to help them but other, other than you know do what I can for the inquiry here in the hopes that we get the final report that we want and that might like you're saying help mm -hmm. other countries but but beyond that it's really hard to know you know what I can do to help people you know I've, I've got no standing whatsoever in, in in argentina or anyone else anywhere else so so i'm not sure but there are people globally impacted that i think will probably never get the recognition they deserve and will probably never get their investigation you know i think we've been really lucky do you work on us every day yeah every day every day it's um it is tricky you know to juggle this in between um you know, I'm, I'm self-employed within marketing, PR, um, str steadily striving into journalism um, as 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 well. And it's it's tricky, you know, to juggle this campaigning, which obviously comes with no income attached to it, um, and actually has took a lot out of my own pocket over the years, a hell of a lot. Um, and trying to juggle that with with work, you know, and um, you know a missus and, a, and an actual life as well outside of that it's almost like having this extra thing in your life that no one else really has right because everyone has their work and their personal life and maybe like a, a passion or a hobby that that they want to do you know i've got we, we've all got all of those things but then there's this bit in the middle which is the oh yeah i've got a campaign for the truth and justice about why my dad's dead you know it's it's, it's a very odd thing to have to you know wedge in to your life daily, every day. Yeah, because then it brings back memories of your dad. It, was, mm -hmm. it brings back so many different memories and so many different emotions, I'd imagine that. Do you think you ever get closure on it? I think, hopefully, there'll be closure in the sense of not having to wake up and have this fight every day. I mean, I don't think there's ever really going to be closure in the sense of... I mean, if, if you if you... If you take this campaign and you remove, let's say you remove any possibility of criminal prosecutions or compensation or uh, ad admittance or acceptance of fault and all of that, and it's literally just a case of you can either not know that your dad's or whatever your connection is to the person that's died, death could have been prevented or it couldn't have been prevented. It's almost like, is it better not knowing or is it better to be told actually um, it what it was our fault and he didn't have to die, he shouldn't have died. Like, is that is it better to know that than to just not? And I'm, I'm honestly not sure because then then what now I've got to live with knowing that, you know, he he, he should, he definitely shouldn't have died and someone, someone was for sure at fault or just living my life where it's, I feel that way, but, you know, maybe that's not the case. I, I honestly don't know what's better in that. So the, I don't think there'll ever be closure in that sense. Yeah, it just, it could be a never ending circle, man. It, did, has anybody ever approached you to say, look, here's some money, back off? No, 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 that's... that's no, no threats, nothing? Oh, I mean, there's been, there's been legal threats 
um, for sure, from um, a number of the companies involved. Some of them veiled, um, some of them le less veiled. So, you know, to, to give you just one of the examples, um, I mentioned Revlon of the 80s, uh, Re Revlon Healthcare, a subsidiary company of theirs manufactured Factor 8 armor. I organized a protest outside Revlon's head office near Houston Station back in 2018. Just, to, you know, we had big media presence at the time. Um, the inquiry was just beginning to kick off. And um, Revlon Inc. had got wind of this protest that I was organizing. And I think it was like the night before, uh, Revlon Inc.'s lead counsel in New York had um, contact, had been trying to contact me on my mobile, but I saw it was an American number and thought, this isn't good, I'm not going to answer this. Um, but so then contacted my lawyers, um, basically in a very uh, veiled way saying that we shouldn't do the protest. And uh, um, in his opinion, Revlon had nothing uh, to do with this. Um, and, and my lawyers had informed me of this, but ultimately I, I decided we're just going to do it because my my outlook then and my still my outlook is now is that I am not going to stop something like that because what can they realistically what can they take from me that that hasn't already been taken in 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 that sense that where well, you're going to sue me for money and then and then what's the they know as well as I do that that story is never in their favor right that Revlon sues the the son of a contaminated blood victim you know is, is crazy so of course they 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 we did the protest anyway uh, and they didn't take any action but you know I, I wouldn't be deterred by something like that i'm i'm quite happy to lose you know every every penny i've got if if i believe in it and it's the truth then then i i won't stop fair play i respect that what about um so i seen a kid in the documentary but he, he's only a baby how how old is that like how's how did that kid get infected? Is that an old video or is that recent? No, no. So, so I, I, I know that um, family. So um, Lee Turton, um, very, very young. I think maybe eight or nine years old. So I, I know his parents well. Colin and Denise Turton, they're they're, they're friends of mine. Um, yeah, kid infected with HIV through Factor Eight died of AIDS, you know, as a, as a, as a kid, you know, that potential gone. Um, parents obviously massively impacted, traumatized by it. And, and there were at least from the documents I've seen, um, a couple of hundred, uh, people who were infected as children died as children, you know, will never know their life, their potential. And, and in many cases, because hemophilia is a hereditary condition um it's usually passed from a female uh from a mother to a son usually um but but a father with hemophilia won't pass it on to their son so my dad wouldn't have passed it on to me um but if my dad had had a daughter his daughter would be a carrier and again this is usually there are exceptions but usually the daughter would be a carrier of the hemophilia gene and then um 50 50 chance they say whether or not the son would have the symptoms of hemophilia so it's a strange kind of hereditary condition but because of that it means there are families where perhaps there were two three four sons who were all infected and died i mean in my own family my dad was actually given up for adoption um at, at birth a couple a few years back um the law had changed, I think around 2015, 2016, the same time I, I began to get involved in campaigning where people whose parents who were adopted that had died could find their birth family. So this applied to my situation. So I set out to find my uh, dad's biological mother. Long story short, what I came to find out was his, his mother had passed away his biological mother but she had another son a few years after my dad was born who also had hemophilia was also infected with hepatitis c and hiv and died a few years after my dad had died so a brother he never knew an uncle i never knew 
but fell to exactly the same fate as as my dad, which just adds another layer of kind of tragedy to this whole story that because it's hereditary, there are families where you've got multiple people impacted in the same family. A good friend of mine, Tony Ferrugia, his father died of HIV. He had an uncle that died of HIV and another uncle that had died from um, he hepatitis, I believe, so multiple family members infected. So, yeah, I mean, the, the family impact it has is massive. And you can just accept that, though, that they've said, okay, we admit that what we've done was wrong and we shouldn't have put that product out there. Do you think that'll make you... That's not going to... For me, looking at it and listening to it, that kids have been dying and fucking families destroyed, yeah. like, an apology wouldn't mean fuck all to me. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know, I get that you want to admit, I get it, but it's still a bit of pill to swallow to listen to yeah. that your your mum's life destroyed, worrying about whether you're going to be infected by a virus. Like, it's fucking nuts to think that that's went on and hundreds of thousands of people have lost their life through something that shouldn't have been shelved. Yeah. Like, it's madness to think that. Is that enough for you to go, okay, right? Well, it's, it's all you really can do. Right, that's that's the, the, best the best thing that you're aiming for. And that I get it, but you would still be thinking, fuckers. It's, it's right. I mean, the, uh, any apology has got to be backed up by something, whatever that something is. I mean, some of the other things that often get forgotten about, I think, that are just as important are, you know, we, we've never had like a minute of silence in Parliament or, or anything like that, which, which maybe that sounds odd, but keep in mind the numbers of people that have died is on a par with 9-11. You know, there's plenty of silences that get held in Parliament over a handful of deaths or even one death or whatever. You know, we've never had that. There's no national memorial, you know, that, that's been funded by the government or anything. There's, it, it's just, I think part of the problem is that with the contaminated blood scandal, um, there's no image and there's no associated co community by it. And so what I mean by that is if, if, you, if you think about Hillsborough, You've got, not only is there a visual of the stadium, but you've also got, you know, it's connection to Liverpool fo Football Club and all this kind of stuff. If you think about with Grenfell, it's kind of, there's the image of, of the burning tower, right? It's very visual, like no one's going to forget that visual. And, and it also became about this wider discussion about working class society and, and, and kind of the governments and councils not caring about particular classes or groups of people and so you had you know icons like Stormzy and, and all these people coming out in support of it with a contaminated blood scandal there's no visual right there's no image people just died in silence wanting it to be kept a secret secret because people don't want other people to know they've got AIDS and there's also no there's nothing you know there's to put it bluntly it's not trendy, right, to, to say, oh, I've got AIDS or I've got HIV. And so very, I think just very few people have wanted to be associated with our campaign. And the people you would think might, because they've had something to do with AIDS, have never got involved. So like Alton John, you know, uh, the, the princes, because Princess Diana had the whole, you know, yeah, a, in Africa. A, AIDS connection. You'd think maybe people like that would get involved. They've all been reached out to multiple times and they never have. But it's not trendy. As soon as some, one person does it. Remember, a lot of these people who campaign for all the other events, I'm not saying they've got bad hearts, but as soon as somebody jumps on it, it spreads like wildfire. People don't want to be part of it because of the goodness of their heart. They want to be part of it because it's fucking trending. Yeah, but there is good people out there that I'm not going to take away from the people that have came forward in certain circumstances and to really help out and really... There's so many good people out there who want to do good, but like you say, it's not trending, it's not popular, but if it's all over the news, it's one of the biggest scandals on the planet and somebody comes forward, everybody will come forward and then support it. That's just... It's just the way it is. It's, it's just the way... There's not many people... I'm not going to say there's not many people who do things for the goodness of the heart because there's so many good out there. There's, there's loads of people who do that, but it's just not trending. Like you say, you're just thinking that there's no yearly fucking ceremony to say, like, just to be acknowledged that people have lost their life through something, one of the biggest cover-ups ever. Like, I get it. Who, who, who's working with the inquiry? Who deals with the inquiry? I mean, I'm I'm there pretty much most days you know our, our lawyers are there every day 
um, there's a, there's a bunch, you know, of us in, campaigning in the community that go. So there's a lot of us that go. I mean, the, the inquiry is being chaired um, by Sir Brian Langstaff, who's a former High Court um, judge. Um, the QC that generally tends to question the witnesses is called um, Jenny Richards. Our QC, Stephen Snowden QC, um, you know, rep represents our interests as well. So there's there's a lot of lawyers involved, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of us from the community that are there. If we're not there in person, people are watching online because the hearings are all streamed on the Infected Blood Inquiry YouTube channel um, as well. So, I mean, in terms of the community, there's huge interest. There's been the odd day where we've had the BBC um, <clears throat> streaming it or Sky News have streamed some of it as well. But it's it's rare. It's, it's one of those things where it's just there. It's going on in the background all the time. And occasionally, you know, we, we get the press. So like when uh, last year, Ken Clark um, gave, gave evidence, um, there was a bit of a press frenzy, you know, over that. But, but that's part of, you know, our task really is, is to try and keep it in the public eye and, and to try and get as much media attention, you know, as, as, as we can to try and avoid it being forgotten. It's, obviously particularly difficult now ever since the pandemic started because um you know the health section of any broadcast or print publication is dominated by covid which has made it even harder for us to to get a look in but um yeah we do what we can and we got we have our moments you know to, to try and keep it yeah. bubbling in the public eye so jason give me the rundown of the whole situation how it started what happened and what's happening now just for to people to get a better understanding because there's a lot of people there will be thinking what the fuck is going on here that i'm not really the best with my words but i understand what you're trying to do and trying to achieve and i get the gist of it but give me the rundown of it kind of how it all began and what with with the inquiry yeah, just, just with everything from the inquiry like why you're inquiring what it takes and what the outcome you think is going to be so I mean, the, the original scandal, the contaminated blood scandal is 4,000 people being infected with hepatitis C, 1,200 with HIV. My father was one of them, died when I was four years old. Over the course of 30 plus years, you know, people have campaigned. We finally in 2017 got an inquiry into it and the inquiry is looking at what happened, who was responsible and could and should anything have been done differently, um, which we say it definitely can. And, um, you know, that inquiry will report at some point um, next year in 23. And we're hoping it will say that the infections of thousands of people with hepatitis C and HIV through this factor eight drug, you know, was avoidable and shouldn't um, have happened. And following from that, um, the hope is that there will be redress restitution and, and, and proper acknowledgement of, of what happened. For anybody that's watching us that maybe wants to get involved and help you out, like, how can they get in touch? Uh, well, they can uh, follow me on Twitter, Facebook. Um, my handles on both those are Jason Evans F8. They can follow the Factor 8 Twitter and Facebook, uh, the Factor 8 YouTube channel uh, and the website factor 8 And um, yeah, obviously, thank you to you as well, James. I, I, I really appreciate him for, for giving me this opportunity to tell the story to a, a wider audience. Yeah, no, any time, like you say, you, you dropped us an email. It's very fascinating. I'm all about this stuff. Like you say, my vocabulary is not the greatest, brother, but I get the gist of everything that's going down. If I can help put exposure on to something that can do right and create a bit of change and a bit of awareness to something that means something to somebody so much and it's the right thing to do then I'll back that one million percent all day long that this is what I'm about is to create a platform for people to tell their story without passing judgment and I don't have all the answers to everybody that comes comes on I don't have the medical cures I wish I did but my job is just to give people a platform and tell it from their side and then you never know what doors it can open you don't know what lives it can change you don't know if you ever get that closure you'll probably live with something that totally the day you die if I'm honest but just to get that little bit of hope that people have fucked up and just admit it as like, is is, is enough for you to just move on with your life and try and enjoy your life but for anybody to watch the documentary as well is this all on the website? Yeah they'll, they'll find the uh, link to the In Cold Blood documentary on the website and it's on uh, shock s-h-o-c-k shockworker.tv um, that's the website of Marcus Oh, right, the, the director of In Cold Blood, um, and, and they can watch it there. It's a full 90-minute documentary, and it really explains the whole thing start to finish, and you'll be able to hear on there the voices 
uh, beyond just mine that, that were impacted by this as well. Listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story and shedding light is something that a lot of people will not know because I didn't know anything about it, if I'm honest. But would you like to finish up on anything? I, th I think I think we've 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 covered a lot of ground, but uh, no, I guess I'd just like to say again, you know, thank you to you for for just getting back in touch and um, you know coming down here setting this up. I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on in there. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, you get the answers you deserve, and um, if so. More than welcome to come on for a part two and discuss it to um yeah, to try and get the ball rolling and maybe get some big people behind it to support it and uh and not forget the lives that are lost through this, that's, which is the most important thing, the families that are destroyed. But again, brother, for coming on, thoroughly enjoyed the what you've got to say and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. God bless.